All right. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of Wave Lab Workflows. I'm Justin Perkins, and this week I have a very special guest, uh, Glenn Schick from Los Angeles. Glenn is a uh, you know multi award winning mastering engineer, um, many gold, platinum albums, um, Grammy nominated and winning albums. And I'm just kind of going through his discography here, which is a very impressive list of credits from Ludacris. Um, two chains. Let's see what else do we have here. All sorts of great stuff. Um, we have. Uh, sorry, I'm. We had some, sort of a couple technical issues here, but um, if you want to just you know, Jay Cole, that's another big one that I reference a lot. If you want to kind of give us a rundown of some of your memorable projects, that would be uh, great. Um, hi everybody. Um, thanks for having me, Justin. Yeah. Uh, Let's see, notable prod people I work with. Uh, I always hate this question. Right. Um, let's see, uh, Future, uh, we've got uh, Jason Isbell, uh, Drive-By Truckers. Uh, yeah, and I was surprised by that one. Ludacris, really? Missy Elliott, uh, Jackal. I mean, I just what I love about mastering is we tend to be kind of all over the map because unlike producers, mastering engineers don't get as pigeonholed into to genres as much. And it's a lot of fun to kind of go all, all over the place. So um, needless to say, Glenn has a very impressive um, list of credits here. And I'm excited to talk to him about mastering and his use of WaveLab. Uh, as you can see in the background there, he's been using WaveLab for a while. So um, if you're watching here, feel free to ask any questions in the, in the comments. We'll keep an eye on that. I have a nice list of questions for Glenn. Uh, but I'd like to start out with just asking... What what got you into mastering? Were you into playing music when you were younger, producing music? Did you have a musical family, or how did you sort of get into the to the kind of niche of mastering itself? Well, um, definitely not musical family. Um, I've been playing uh, guitar and some other instruments. I play some keys and bass, and I've uh, been playing in bands and doing session stuff since I was like. I started around 10, but I started doing like real work for people, like maybe around 16 and uh, starting doing sessions. Uh, I grew up in New York City and uh, started doing sessions and playing with anybody I can play with back then. And, uh, you know, I started as a musician slash, uh, you know, early producer. Um, I also ended up just stumbling into the early hip hop scene in New York back in the 80s. And uh that kind of led me down another pathway too. So um, it's been an interesting ride, but uh, yeah, I think I'm on my third generation of hip hop now. So oh, that's great. And you spent some time in Atlanta, is that correct? Uh, Twenty-seven years. Wow, so that's, that's definitely some time. Yeah. Okay. Was it primarily mastering in Atlanta, or were you still producing and mixing? Uh, I opened my mastering place in 1994 in Atlanta, and. Okay. Um, I had a tracking mixing studio there before, like an old uh, uh, analog two inch uh, analog board setup, and uh, was doing some local acts that, you know, were kind of, I, I guess, up and coming then, like Escape and things like that, and uh, some of the Atlanta R&B and uh, other groups there. And uh, I got into mastering like a couple of years later. Um, so that was early 90s. So a couple of years later, uh, I had somebody that kind of shoved me into the mastering end of things. Uh, and uh, I, I really didn't plan any of this. So, Right. I'm kind of the same way. I had no plans. I just really liked music and it, it kind of snowballed from there. I did see on your website that you, you no longer cut lacquers for vinyl. Is that something you did for a period of time? Yeah, I had a, a Neumann lathe and uh, in Atlanta, we used to uh, cut a bunch of lacquers and uh, yeah, I had uh, uh, the lathe for quite some time. I picked that up actually in the UK, uh, a VMS 70 and uh, yeah, I used to cut lacquers uh, along with, uh, uh, you know, my guy uh, who worked for me at the time, Colin Leonard. So. Okay. And was that more in the nineties when vinyl was on the decline or was it, were you guys... It was just when it was starting to come up, but it kind of came up uh, exponentially. It was just kind of like a very slow increase at the start there. And I was guess uh, I guess the timing was just at the start, kind of before it really ramped up. Gotcha. But, so, of course, I got rid of it when the lathe was worth 
you know, <laughs> about a third of what it would sell for. Right. I mean, and, and in some genres, like I kind of grew up in the punk scene and you with hip hop, I mean, in some genres, vinyl didn't really fully die off. I mean, we see all the bands I used to work with back then are still doing vinyl. Um, but what we're seeing is just a lot of people that you might not expect in, in 2020 doing vinyl. And that's just really it you know, caused the bottleneck of production and stuff like that. But I was just curious how into lacquer cutting you were and, and if it was your main thing for a while or if it was something you just added on to your services when you did the digital mastering. Um, I had the the kind of foresight to know that uh, vinyl was just kind of uh, dying off at that time and there were right. less and less cutters. And um, so I picked up a lathe kind of figuring that some of the traffic would end up you know, uh, funneling down to us and it did, but, uh, I didn't quite hang on to it long enough to really kind of make it worthwhile. And to be absolutely honest, vinyl was a huge headache. Um, it's kind of like having an old car and you have to kind of constantly bang on it and fix it. And, uh, the parts are all proprietary and hard to get, if not impossible. So, uh, yeah. yeah. As someone that's not very mechanical, I, I have no real interest in doing it myself. I mean, I appreciate the art, and I'm glad there's people that love doing it. I'm, I know even if a lathe landed in my studio tomorrow, I don't know if I would want to go down that path right now. But, well, that's cool. I was just kind of curious about that. And then I, I assume word of mouth is – I always think word of mouth is the biggest way to grow a client base. Is that what you found too? I mean, you do one album or project, and it just – people hear that and that your name's on it and they say, let's work with that guy. Yeah. I think that's, you know, very true. But, um, I think the, the project that really launched me in Atlanta was, uh, uh Ludacris's first album. And that was kind of a, a big deal and really kind of put us on the map along with him. And, uh, we kind of grew up together in Atlanta there. So that's cool. I mean, obviously when you're working with the artist that's starting out, you're working closely with them. I'm always curious you know, I've worked with some, I've done some fairly big names, but, um, you know, when you're working with someone that's like Grammy level in currently, um, are you, are you mostly working with their management and team and producer or how, like as a ratio, how often are you talking directly with the art, those kind of artists? Are they kind of checked out at that point? Cause they've done their thing and they just trust the process or do you get a lot of bigger artists that are really sort of hands-on and want to be in there and, and know everything you're doing? Um, for the most part, I hardly ever talk directly with big artists. Um, it's almost always either record company or producer or management that bring those kind of projects in. And, you know, the artist usually has some good trust in you if they're bringing it to you. So there's no really uh, big back and forth unless they want like a little tweak or something after. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, for the most part, I talk to indie artists more. Uh, and I talk to uh, producers a lot, and I talk to a lot of mix engineers as well, too. So, Yeah, I, and I noticed on your website, I thought it was cool that you said, you know, independent artists is at the backbone of your business, and I find that to be true. And especially as record labels have sort of dissipated and everyone's releasing on their own, I feel like those kind of independent artists need a little, little more help getting across the finish line. You know, aside from doing the mastering, you're explaining, like, here are your files, and here's, you know, what you want to do with these files. And you, you shouldn't just send a bunch of WAV files to your CD manufacturer because, well, some might accept that, that can also lead to problems. So here's this other, here's the DDP file. So do you find yourself kind of helping out those kind of independent artists, it's at least on their first time around, first couple albums? No, absolutely. The uh, um, Kevin at my office, who's been with me forever, um, he ends up uh, having to explain what, uh, distribution is for people and, you know, what CD uh, databases are and, you know, uh, explain all the kind of basics to a lot of artists that just don't have a clue. And, uh, you know, when we give them files, I'll usually end up kind of having to explain the, the technical end of things like, you know, what's high resolution audio? What's the difference between Apple digital masters? Uh, what's the difference in the MP3s? Do I need this? Do I need that? Right. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I basically have an email template that is already typed out, and I just paste in the link and say, "Here you go." But yeah, I do find that you know, back in the day, we had we had more record company, you know, staff to handle all those things, and the artists could truly check out. But then, 
I find the independent artists, aside from being closer to the project and really, really excited about it, um, they also have to be responsible for handing it off to manufacturing and distribution. So I want to take a little bit of a left turn, but it does relate to streaming, and it's a pretty popular topic. Um, I personally don't do it, but are you finding that any of your clients want different level masters, you know, for streaming versus if they're still releasing on CD? Or are you just doing one a one size? I don't want to say make that sound lazy, but are you just finding one level that works for everything real nicely? Or are you getting requests for that? Um, for the most part, we, we do hear from clients occasionally uh, saying, you know, I heard Spotify is at negative 14 and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, uh, maybe I need a different master for that. And, um, you know, we quickly explain to him that it's not in their best interest to try to tailor something to those platforms. Um, I mean, uh, Spotify, you know, changes as does most of these things. Uh, you don't want to put out a master that, you know, suddenly isn't compatible. And uh, regardless of all that, um, it just sounds better to make a proper master uh, that sounds good on everything. So um, I agree. I clients that have to, you know, go, is this the right version for Instagram? Is this the right version for Spotify? And then, you know, oh, I sent the, the record label, my Instagram version, uh, you know, just too much. It, yeah, it gets way too, I, I'm with you. I think one mass, you know, aside from vinyl, which has, you know, some more limitations, you know, one, one level loudness to kind of rule them all. Um, I just think it's going to also stand the test of time better too. And I always, pre you know, there's this myth that all streaming services normalize. And as you know, that's not really true. Like Apple Music, if you go buy a new iPhone or Mac today and you install, you start using Apple Music, you know, by default, the sound check setting is off. So everyone, unless the user turns that on, they're hearing everything at the native original level. And you can argue whether that's good or bad, but that is true. Whereas, you know, Spotify, if you install that app today and start subscribing, and Amazon, and most of them really, that's off. So we can't really make a blanket statement that all streaming does this. It's just, it's such it's such a big mess that I'm with you. You know, make one that just works everywhere. Um, I don't think anyone's not liked a song because it was too quiet, and um, we just want it to sound good. And on that note, I know that um, you mastered one of the J. Cole albums that, Ian Shepard awarded the Dynamic Range Day. Um, and, you know, people have mixed feelings on that. It's a little political. But I'm curious if if you had a conversation with his producer or artist or himself about doing that, or did it naturally happen? Or, you know, how did that particularly come about? Because I think it's a great sounding album. And I, I use it myself as reference when some of my clients are, like, deciding if their thing's loud enough or should it be this or that. I'm like, well, listen to this j cole record it sounds amazing it was very successful um it's not the loudest thing ever it's very clear and by not going super loud it really leaves you room for a whole lot more low end to to do its thing without getting distorted and getting weird so can you talk about that album and the process a little bit sure um the mixer uh a guy named mez who i work with uh and actually j cole himself uh who i talked to about this um, his big thing was, you know, he had a shootout for mastering originally with a few guys and, uh, you know, he said, oh, you got the gig. And I said, what got me the gig? And he said, your bass was better than anybody's. So, um, you know, it was all about low end for him on that record. And, um, for that record, because I was kind of trying to preserve the low end and dynamic, um, I had to fight a little for not blasting the masters and you know it was a little struggle to be honest uh it, it's not what most artists want to have like an album that's not you know louder than everybody else uh albeit uh, uh less loud um but uh you know we talked and eventually you know we kind of settled on the levels i had and okay. uh you know the low end kind of i think speaks for itself then, so. right and we're not talking i haven't actually analyzed that one extremely closely and you know, Ian Shepard has the loudness penalty website, but I'm guessing it's it's probably still maybe slightly above the point where Spotify might be turning it down a dB or, you know, a small amount. I don't know if I haven't measured it, but it's we're not talking insanely quiet here. We're just talking about not not abusing it or not trying to make it do something it's not going to do. And uh, it's reasonable. <laughs> re exactly reasonable. I mean, we we came out of the 2000s with everything getting progressively louder 
And I'm sure you remember the Daft Punk album, Random mm-hmm. Access Memories. That thing sounded amazing. So much low end, you know, octaves you didn't even know existed. And I think part of what makes that work is how reasonable they they mastered it. It just sounds amazing. And it was ver- very successful. So, you know, to some degree, there's really no relationship between how loud it is and how successful it is. But I'm glad you mentioned the test master thing, because um, do you do a lot of test masters or is it something you do if, if it feels right? Test masters for vinyl or test masters oh, for the oh, I'm sorry. I guess I should say shootouts. You know, are you, um, is that something you do often or just when you feel like it's the right project that you really want to do? Generally, you don't get to choose if you're in a shootout or not. Yeah, that's true. Um, Sometimes you don't know. Yeah, no, a lot of times the client won't even tell you. And, uh, you know, I had somebody last year who, uh, you know, was like, oh, I, I actually tried seven different guys for this. And uh, I, I kind of went, that's kind of crazy. Like one song, uh, you know, you paid for seven mastering sessions with seven different engineers, uh, which, you know, is a little cuckoo crazy for me. But, um, you know, some people are very particular about what they want. Yeah, and, I can get that. And I, and I can respect that if they're going to pay for it. We've kind of get, gotten to a point where some artists are expecting you to work, do the work for free until... And then they pick, and it, to me, it's too much of a lottery. And I, I've taken a stance against not doing this because for reasons you mentioned, I've won test masters for being pretty loud. I've lost test masters for going too loud. And without any communication, like, hey, this is what we really like. And then you send them one and they say, it's close, but let's do this. Those are all super easy. But if you're just blindly mastering it without any feedback and then getting your... um master thrown into a hat and it's, it's just too random for me it just becomes a disrespect of people's time i think to do it that way when i think just pick someone you know or i mean like i said if you want to pay someone to do it then that's their decision to use it or not but it is it's an interest, interesting concept and i was inter, it was it uh caught my attention that you mentioned that but i thought that was cool that you won because you didn't abuse it and you just did what felt right for it and and uh clearly it worked because it was it was it was the first album of his that i was aware of i'm not aware of his entire history but that's that seemed to be a a breakthrough album for him at the time uh, when that when that came out yep it was a fun project yeah cool well let's shift into uh, mastering with headphones exclusively um, and i know you're open to talking about this and i know that's also a political topic of you know, traditionally mastering and recording and mixing is done on speakers and headphones are often used out of necessity, you know, for isolation if you're recording, uh, for mixing to check as a double check, kind of a reference point to, to uh, just see how the bass or something sounds in headphones you like. Obviously for quality control, they're very useful for hearing distortion, click and, clicks and pops, but you were probably one of the first people I've heard of that transitioned exclusively to mastering on headphones and was there a certain moment in time that brought you to that? Was it a gradual shift or did you stumble upon a certain pair of headphones that you just decided these are better than speakers in a room? Um, I closed down my analog studio back in 2012. And when I did, I set up kind of a mobile rig and became a nomad and traveled around the world. And at that time, uh, I set up with a really kind of basic setup uh, had a little A to D and uh, uh, some good in-ear monitors, which was what I was using for the first bunch of years. And, um, you know, did pretty good with that and, you know, traveled to eight different countries. I lived in, you know, a whole bunch of different great places. And, uh, you know, every few months I'd go to a new country and set up in an Airbnb and, uh, you know, master away. So a lot of these albums were done uh since 2012 in places like South Korea or Taiwan or uh, Iceland. And uh, matter of fact, I'm going back to Iceland in uh, about a week. Um, And uh, the headphone thing came when uh, a buddy of mine, a producer in the UK, uh, Paul Stacey uh, said, Oh, I have uh, these amazing, uh, you know, uh, headphones. And um, you know, they're the only thing that kind of sounds right that I've heard yet. And I said, well, I, must hear those. And uh, I found out the company, which uh, I can give them a little plug, a company called uh, Audizy, uh, who uh, make these beautiful uh, cans. Um, that was not a paid promotion. Um, they, um, 
they were in Southern California here. And I said, well, you know, they're here. Let me go check out a pair. And uh, I took a listen and uh, I really loved the low end. That was really like the first thing that, that was just, okay, that's right. That feels like I can tell the same as when I was in my Francis Manzella room with, you know, a hundred thousand dollar speakers. And, uh, you know, that was a revelation. I was like, oh, if I can really judge the low end, I can do amazing work. And uh, so I've been running on those for, I don't know, the past, I think I got them probably right around that J. Cole time. That was one of the first projects I probably did with them. So uh, well, it worked. Um, yeah. I would say it worked. I'm, I'm with you. I'm not afraid to master on headphones anymore. As soon as I heard the Z headphones, I was like, wow, you know, it's like wearing a world-class control room on your head and it never changes and it can go anywhere. And um, up until then, I just sort of tolerated headphones. But when I heard those, I was like, I just, I really love those headphones. Um, they're fun to listen to. You can make, I feel like you can make, actually make decisions on them and um, they're just great. Um, uh, Wave Lab, as you know, has the uh, the playback processing slots in the master section. Um, I personally don't use any, but do you use any of the um, headphone correction software or you just keep it natural? Um, I've tried a few of them. Um, and the best one I heard so far, uh, Acoustica had a pretty nice one called Sienna. Uh, but for myself, I find uh, I do my best work in a pure signal path. Um, I think things like those uh, type of software, room emulation and uh, correction software is best suited for mix environment uh, because that's really where elements start uh, changing balance. But I've already got somebody that's committed to all the balance of all the, the mix on the track. And I just want to make that the best. So with a pure signal path, I find I can do my best work. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I, I've tried a few. None of it really spoke to me. And um, even though in Wave Lab, you know, if you put um, the correction in the playback processing slots, you know, the good thing is it doesn't influence the Wave Lab meters. So obviously, if the correction software has to first turn it down six decibels to get headroom and then do its EQ changes, you know, that's not showing up on your Wave Lab meters, which is obviously ideal. But I do use a couple external meters that I'm kind of just used to, the Doro and um, another piece of software. And, you know, if I were to use that, it would certainly throw off all of that metering. And I just found that it's, you know, like you said, it's useful for mixing, especially if you're in a less than ideal room or on some cheaper headphones like I have for this interview. But I think when you get into the Odyssey range, you know, the pure signal path, I mean, I think you can easily learn it and it's, it's, it's going to be better overall. In my opinion, I haven't tried every single one and Maybe in a few years that'll change, but for now, I'm I was just curious if you used any of that stuff. Um, so for those that don't know, in Wave Lab, there's the playback processing slots, and um, people you can insert meters, um, room or headphone correction, and that's anything that you don't want to be actually rendered when you are done with your audio, but you can still hear it and see it, so things like that. So um, yeah, actually, um, speaking of the, the that section. Uh, I also use that section a lot and uh, also set up a separate, like if you look at the, this guy, this monitor here, right. this is actually a whole nother wave lab station uh, that I set up just for, you know, uh, running monitoring on and use that uh, live input on there. Okay. Uh, that seems to work great. So, so, so you just uh, metering what you're listening to with a whole mm -hmm. nother instance of wave lab and it's just always running. Yep. I have a, yeah. I have a similar thing because, you know, the metering in wave lab is great when you're working, but I bet you, um, well, I don't know about you, but, you know, if you switch over to listen to a streaming service to reference something, you know, you still want to have at least some metering, of course, so that you can uh, see the see what that looks like on the meters. And, and you can do that with reference tracks in WaveLab now. You can, you know, reference tracks in WaveLab 10 can have a live input. You know, you can, obviously you can put audio on it and, and switch over to that, but it could also be a live input if you had a streaming service or a CD player or what have you. So anyways, well, that's cool. Well, let's, let's talk about wave lab a little bit. I know you said you've been using it for a while and are, are you, um, you're on a PC right now. Is that right? That is correct. So you've probably been using it since before version seven, obviously, because version seven is when it came to Mac, but when did you start using wave lab? And I guess a better question is, were you using, you don't have to name any names, but were you using something else and you hit a wall 
and you needed to find WaveLab, or was it more organic, or what brought you to WaveLab specifically? You're pretty close, actually. Um, so I've been using WaveLab since I think uh, 2006 is when we got on the platform, and uh, we we used WaveLab six, which actually uh, was a great sounding DAW, and. Uh, uh, it's funny because when they went to seven, I didn't think it was as good sounding as six was. Huh. And uh, it, it, it just, you know, kind of got good again when it hit back to, I think, nine, eight, five or nine. I can't remember. But, uh, you know, whatever engine they were using, just kind of uh, I think seven kind of suffered a little bit. Six was brilliant. And uh, yeah, I, I was using another DAW platform and it was having problems with uh uh, I had to do really painful, slow tape backups, exabyte and DDP backups. And uh, that was just taking forever. And we had a giant like storage closet that was, you know, piled deep with, you know, uh, eight millimeter tapes and uh, the Sony drives that those things ran would break all the time. And uh, it was a headache. So I wanted something that had better access and easier to do backups on. And we switched over all our workstations. I think we had four workstations then, and because uh, uh, we had like two mastering rooms and an edit room and the gotcha. room running, and uh, yeah, we we switched them all over to Wave Lab Six, and we're very happy with it. Yeah, I know at least two people that are still using Six, um, just because it's always worked for them. And some people, if it's not broke, don't fix it, but. Was there a point where, you know, because, you know, WaveLab is specialized for mastering, and there's a lot of people that sort of slowly enter the world of mastering for mixing, and myself included. And obviously, you can do the stereo processing in any piece of software. It doesn't matter what it is. But there's a point in the mastering process where some of those programs just factually don't do certain things, you know, when it comes to arranging the songs, exporting all the formats, you know, track you know cd track markers the cd text the metadata and stuff like that and i feel like you know at some point people just realize that they're they're falling short you know the, the program they're trying to use whether it be cubase or pro tools or logic those are all fine for recording and mixing but then you hit a point where you're just you can and maybe some of it you can do but it's not the right tool it's pretty inefficient you know it'd be like driving a 2005 Buick around a racetrack like you can do it but you're just really slow or it's just not even in the same league so was there certain features of WaveLab that that caught your attention when you first started looking at it or was it just um, the whole package um I'd say the biggest thing for me was the montage and I like the fact that you can pretty much do everything in the montage on WaveLab and uh, I don't really like having to jump around like a you know, uh, sometimes I'll do some video editing and you have to jump to like different pages to do, you know, other processes within your montage, so to speak. And uh, it's much better when I can kind of stay in one medium and get everything from, you know, sequencing an album to running a master to, you know, uh, adding metadata uh, and not have to go somewhere else. Right. I mean, you know, the audio editor is obviously powerful. And if, if you do a lot of post-production broadcast, things like that, I could see why you uh, gravitate towards the audio editor. But even if I'm doing a single song, it's in the montage because of everything you mentioned and more. And of course, EPs and albums, the montage is just meant for that. And sometimes I, I see people say, oh, I've, I use WaveLab, but I've never checked out the montage. And to me, the montage is WaveLab. I mean, it's, it's, what, it's, it's what makes it WaveLab, just being able to do it all in one and, you know, I see that a lot on the forums, too. People are like, I mastered my album, but now I have to, you know, sequence it and do this and that. And to me, that's still mastering. You know, you're not done with the mastering process. And that's kind of where WaveLab gets you across the finish line. You know, it was built for that. And, of course, you can do all the stereo processing. But um, do you have any, you know, I use a lot of third-party plugins, and I know you do as well. Um, are there any plugins in WaveLab that you find to be... Um, useful or any features at least that you, you know, s specific to WaveLab? Uh, I mean, for the most part, uh, what I do is pretty simple in WaveLab. Uh, I'll, I'll run some uh, plugs on my master bus and uh, kind of run individual uh, songs and kind of save them on their own uh, montage. So, okay. uh, you know, I'll, I'll have like a collection of, you know, if it's 10 songs for the album, I'll have, 10 montages with, you know, their mastering plugs set up and, okay. 
um, you know, then I do a arranging montage. So, uh, I, you know, I, I find that's my best workflow. So. Yeah. That's not too different than what I do. Cause you know, it helps to get all the heavy lifting done because then when you d make your assembly montage and you have to render that it's relatively quick at that point, sure. especially when clients are getting into song spacing, like, can you add another second between these two songs? You know, if you got all your processing locked in, that's a very quick change. Whereas if it's got to crunch all the numbers again and again, then then you're eating up a lot of time like that. So, yeah, I'm I'm the same way with, with the montage. Um, do you ever? Um, and we could talk more about this later too. But do you ever use any like the clip effects in the montage? Or are you just sticking with the master section um, for the most part? I'm kind of a purist. You know, okay. I, I did some uh, stuff mostly like. Uh, I, I use a lot of stuff from Plugin Alliance and a couple of other people and, yeah. um, you know, just really simple uh, plugs, you know, EQ compressor. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, I think people are sometimes surprised how simple the process can be. I mean, I've, I've had mix engineers tell me what's on their mix bus and there's like seven plugins. I'm like, Whoa, <laughs> that's a lot of plugins. Like um, what does it sound like if you turn them off and then think about it, you know, with a fresh approach here? Cause yeah, we're, we're doing very simple things in mastering, you know, usually, um, you know, it's getting a little, Oh, and the other thing I wanted to ask you is, um, how often do you master from stems? If at all, are you a fan of it? Not a fan. I try to avoid it personally. I, I had a very interesting, uh, call last week and the guy said, Oh man, uh, I heard, you know, so much about you and I'm looking forward to working with you and I've got these stems. And, you know, I, I, I'm going to need your, your full input. And uh, I kind of said, um, well, you know, I'm not a big fan of stems. I think that's mixing. And, uh, you know, I think mixing choices should be with the mixer. And uh, he got a little huffled about it and uh, said, okay, I guess you're not my guy. And I said, I guess I'm not. Um, but I really feel strongly about this, that, you know, uh, the mixing process should be with the mixer because now you're deciding vocal levels and, you know, if it's like a lot of stems, you know, drum and bass levels and, uh, you know, that's not my, it's my wheelhouse, but it's not my uh, purview to say this is where your mix should be. And, you know, unless you're giving me a mixer credit on the album, um, I'd rather just stay as a mastering engineer. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think we're both, you know, fairly busy mastering every day. And when we're just used to working with stereo files and when someone puts you in that position of here's a hundred, hundred times more decisions to make than you normally would on a project for me, that overwhelms me. I just can't even like, I, I don't even know what to do. I, I've said things like, you know, even though they're stems, I can refer you to a mix engineer that can mix these stems and then I'll, I'll still do the stereo masterings. I think there's value there, but and then the other thing too is, you know, I don't do it often and maybe I'm not the best judge, but just the challenge of getting accurate stems is a whole thing. Like, you know, you could get those stems, put them all at zero. There's still a chance that that's not their mix because something went wrong with their export. And then you're not only making decisions, you're wondering even if you have the right baseline. It just, for me, it's just too, I'd rather refer that work out and, and hopefully master it later. But I was just curious if you, I know certain styles of music are more STEM friendly, I guess you could say. And there are some people that enjoy it for some reason. I just, for me, it was never, never appealing. I've done it on maybe two occasions, but I tried to make one occasion was just, well, the, the mix engineer fell ill and he couldn't finish mixing. And the, the person wanted the music more aggressive, but the vocals to not become too sibilant and, edgy and he said i can send you the music and the vocals and i said you know this is, a, this is a rare case so i'll agree to this and it was a long time client but and then the other time was um I, the only time i've ever requested stem someone was self-mixing themselves clearly in their bedroom probably on worse headphones than these but i knew it was going to vinyl and there was an insane amount of vocal sibilance and an insane amount of plosives because they didn't seem to have a pop filter and I rarely even ask for mix revisions, let alone stems. I take it as it is. I knew it was going to vinyl, and I said, you know, these plosives and sibilants are just going to be a real problem on vinyl. You know, I asked him if he would take another look at it. So he wasn't able to fix it in the mix. So I said, okay, you know, can you send me the music vocals separately, and I'll fix it. But, I mean, that's two times in almost 15 years that I've had to do it. Otherwise, 
I think, yeah, you're right. You know, get the mix right and we'll worry about, you know, the mastering specific things. So, sure. well, cool. I'm just checking out a question here on, on YouTube. Um, and I actually was thinking of asking you this, but since it came up, um, your thoughts on, on Dolby Atmos, because it's a hot topic right now. And have people been requesting that from you um, or that you do it or... For me, it hasn't come up yet. And maybe it's because I don't offer it, but curious if you're where your head is, if you're keeping an eye on it or where your head's at with, with Atmos and things like that. So um, I was a big proponent and early adopter of uh, uh, surround audio. So my old studio in Atlanta, I had a full analog six channel surround mastering setup. And um, you know, it was really good. And we did a bunch of DVDs at the time for uh, Surround 5.1. And, uh, you know, that, that was cool. I loved it. Um, and I, I love uh, multi-channel audio. But uh, Atmos is kind of a new guy in the field. Not new, new, but, uh, you know, it's just kind of coming in. And a lot of uh, the bigger companies like Amazon are starting to incorporate it in their product. Uh, I'm going to start offering it at some point. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. And I, I want to just make sure I can do it the way I want to do it first. And, uh, you know, it'll be incorporated in some time. But as far as requests from clients, uh, I've had like, uh, maybe a couple of requests right now to just kind of feel out pricing. Uh, but for the most part, nobody really knows uh, pricing <laughs> and everything else. It's all right. like uh, the Wild West when it comes to uh, multi-channel just like it was with 5.1 in the early days so yeah i'm still feeling it out i mean i remember when studios were really ramping up their 5.1 setups but then the ipod came along and suddenly people were instead of wanting to listen on speakers they wanted their whole library in their pocket on the ipod and i, I think that was sort of the that really prevented 5.1 from becoming what i would call a standard but I, I still think i think with atmos too like People are going to do it just like people are still mixing in 5.1, If you, especially classical, certain genres and certain level artists, you know, um, you know, the, the high level Grammy level artists, they might. But to me, that's a whole separate process. Like someone's going to do a whole separate mix for that. And kind of like post like film, there really is no mastering per se. I mean, they kind of handle it all in the mix. And I kind of wonder if Dolby, I wonder if Atmos mastering is really going to be sought after or if the Atmos mixes are also going to be the masters because, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I both saw and read that everything Atmos is playing back at minus 18 LUFS anyway. So we're not trying to fight for every last, you know, decibel of, you know, a mastering engineer can help you. If you want a crazy loud master, a mastering engineer can help you carve out what doesn't need to be there and enhance certain things to get you from, you know, really loud to super loud and have it still, you know, not be totally destroyed. But I think when we're in it more in the broadcast level loudness, you know, I wonder how, I wonder how much people are going to be even seeking out mastering engineers for Atmos. You know, it's going to be interesting to see how, how it plays out. Um, but I have not ordered a dozen speakers yet and I'm not even thinking, I'm not even looking at prices for them. Um, here's kind of a diff. um, there's a mastering engineer, um, Brian Murphy that had a few questions for you. Some of them we've already touched on, but he was, this is kind of a, I would say um, left field question, but when you pack up and travel with your master rig, um, what sort of cases and backpacks do you use? Is it something you can carry on or is it more elaborate where you have to check it and make sure that it's handled correctly? So uh, as I mentioned, I'm heading back to Iceland in about a week and uh, everything, including my clothing are going on one carry on bag. So, Wow. Yep. And, are, and I don't want to get too personal. Are you going to Iceland just because it's a cool thing to do and you want to change the scenery? Or are you going, because I have read that you also like to travel to the studio of the artists sometimes and really get in there and kind of go, have some back and forth with them while they're mixing, you know, like here's what your mix is going to sound like if I do my thing. And if, if you, if you're not happy with something, it's probably best if you adjust the mix and then I do my thing again and we, have a sort of back and forth and a collaboration about it. So are you, um, and you obviously you don't have to name any names, but is it more to collaborate directly or is it just sort of a night? Nice, everyone's been kind of holed up in the same spot for a while. So maybe it's just a change of scenery for you. 
I, I think there's multiple reasons to go, but uh, uh, one's for a change of pace. You know, I'm out in the Mojave Desert and it's a thousand degrees here. You're probably seeing me sweating here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'd love to get away from the heat a little bit, but uh, 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 besides that, um, I have a ton of clients in Iceland and, um, you know, I like to go visit them and socialize and uh, sometimes go to their studios, um, you know, just kind of, you know, see people I've had a relationship with, you know, for 15 years. So um, it's been a, a, a kind of constant uh, thing. I think I started going to Iceland since like 2007. So uh, I've had a long-term love affair with that country So and their music. Right. And, you know, to go back where we started, I mean, word of mouth is just, you know, people always ask me about getting started and mastering, especially when I was teaching at a tech school. And it's, I think, you know, everything is getting more fast paced over decades and decades. But I mean, I think sometimes people starting out don't realize how much of a slow build it is to have build a client base. I mean, it's just really, really slow. And, you know, there's, there's countries such as Italy where I've got a lot of client, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say random, but you know, you, ha you do a record, someone likes it, then they're, peers and other so um i definitely understand and i would like to be able to do that someday too. go to italy i mean i've been to italy but to go there and work and collaborate and be able to master kind of on the spot uh, with that that would be a lot of fun um so that's cool that you're going to be able to do that well if um and we're not done with the interview but while we're on that topic i'm sure they'll be posting some um photos and whatnot so if people want to find you on instagram is it is it gs mastering on instagram at GS Mastering, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, same. Okay. And Brian also had one other um, question that was related to that, and I'm trying to scroll to it. Um, but I know everyone's, and this is a nip, but I know everyone's talking about, tired of talking about COVID, but um, do you think it's helped or harmed the music industry? And, um, you know, in my, I'm sure you feel the same for, for mastering. I've never been busier because everyone's got time to make stuff and they're probably making it not at, not as often at professional studios. So it might need even more help with cleanup and, and stuff like that. And people are also digging up old stuff. I've had people send me old live stuff that they just never did anything with. So I would like, you know, you can tell us your experience, but how do you think it's impacted things, you know, in the near term and for the future? Sure. Um, obviously it's had an impact on every industry. Um, for us, we actually went up probably like 30% increase since COVID started. Uh, you know, much like yourself, I think, uh, it just was a, a reflection of all the people that were home making music, including like the big artists. Right. And, uh, so the fact that they couldn't tour meant they wanted to put out some product and represent. And, uh, you know, I feel bad for all my friends that are, you know, front of house guys and tour managers and they've suffered badly this last you know year and a half but uh for studio guys you know it's it's been a you know silver lining in all this that you know uh everybody i know is actually busier now uh and has been because of what's going on so yeah you know we have the technology and tools as we talked about to work just about anywhere now and uh, whether it's computer horsepower or monitoring and obviously software tools i mean it's 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 pretty incredible, um, and uh, there's one more question here from from the YouTube chat. Um, there's not an actual name, so I'm not going to say it. But and this is kind of a vague question. But do you have a position on loudness versus dynamics? Do you let the client give you any input, or do you do what feels natural and adjust from there based on their feedback? I mean, the client's always welcome to give input, but um, it, whether I recommend that is another story it just depends on what he's wanting um you know I, I do what's right for every project so uh you know if i'm doing you know a project today it's not going to be at the same level as the project tomorrow because the music's going to uh dictate what level that's going to be at so uh it, it's what feels good and it always will be so yeah i mean if a traditional it's not uncommon to do a traditional jazz album on monday and you're doing a metal album on Tuesday and uh, a bluegrass album on Wednesday. And it's, those are all different levels. And one thing I had to explain to my students when I was teaching is we're basically using all the same tools every day, you know, EQ, maybe some compression, a limiter. You know, there, I, I, I personally don't believe there's like a hip hop limiter and a metal limiter 
or a metal EQ and a jazz EQ. I mean, there's, you know, to some degree, but it's not like, uh, you know, you can't just make a blanket statement about that. I, for me, it's the tools are just the tools. I, I, you know, I'm at a point in my career where I wouldn't care if it just had the generic graphic interface with no, I mean, I like some nice looking plugins, but you know, they're just tools. So I was just, that was a, that was a question about loudness versus dynamics. I mean, would you say you've seen the trend come down at all with loudness now that people are getting aware of what streaming's doing or is it more or less the same? No, I don't think anything's changed yeah. so much with loudness. It's uh, people still, you know, have that uh, perceived volume thing uh, and, and just kind of, you know, always will gravitate towards the louder master. So, uh, I mean, it, it hasn't really changed. Yeah. Be, I've yeah. seen a slight increase in people saying it sounds good, but can we just make it a touch less louder? Like a slight increase in those requests, but I still get plenty of it sounds great, but can you make it louder? And, sure. uh, and of course, a lot of good version one approvals. So um, I'm going to read one more of Brian's questions. Um, he had a whole bunch of them that we've already touched on. And um, one of them, we, um, I'm just trying to find it here because we, it, it related to uh, what we were talking about here, but for some reason it's, it's, it's passing me by. I did want to ask, do you get into any remastering and any restoration um, tools in WaveLab? Like, um, you know, how, if, whether it's a remastering thing of something old or even, um, you know, new projects where the noise floor might increase as we're mastering um i see this a lot especially now that people are recording from home they're doing acoustic track in their living room their bedroom and there's a hvac running or a refrigerator or they're on a busy street and with an unmastered mix that's not limited that stuff no pun intended kind of flies under the radar but then when they want the loudest master of all time you know all that noise floor comes up too and we we do have tools to either minimize or get rid of it. I was curious how much you find yourself doing of that. And um... uh, for the most part, if there's problems that the client can fix, I'll kind of point that first. Uh, so, you know, if something's exceptionally like, you know, sibilant or whatever, I'll say, Hey, you know, maybe you want to go back and put strap a, a DS on that vocal and send it back to me. Uh, and, you know, other problems, depending on if the client can go fix them or not, uh, it's always better if it's repaired before it comes to me. But uh, if I'm really in need of working on something, I'll probably open up something like uh, Isotope RX-8 and, uh, you know, do some, you know, restoration or fixes in there, uh, you know, clicks, pops, denoise, that kind of thing. Yeah, for me, the mouth clicks get distracting. I mean, they can really become amplified. I mean, I've never really been to a show or a live performance and heard mouth clicks, but when you get someone one or two inches from a nice mic and layers of compression, it, it really becomes all of a sudden the mouth click is as loud as the snare drum or the tambourine, and that can get a little distracting. So um, another interesting topic, I think, for mastering engineers, um, if you get if someone sends you a mix... I don't like to talk about headroom because that's kind of boring, but if you get mixes that are already peak limited, um, do you typically roll with that or do you ask if they might have some versions without limiting that you can attempt to obviously start from and at least meet or exceed you know, what they had with their limiting? Um, I've changed philosophy about that over the years. And back in the day uh, when somebody strapped like a, a, a TC finalizer across the two bus and sent me a loud mix, I would say, Oh, send it back without, you know, the, the finalizer on it or in L3 or whatever it was back then. And now uh, most mixers have a good uh, workflow where they end up putting stuff on their bus going out and um, it's part of their sound. So I find it really unproductive to get a mixer to undo stuff he already did the way he wanted. And I'd much rather have a mix the way you wanted it sounding uh, even if it's not the optimum dynamic range or whatever, I mean, that's not the most important part. The most important part is that, you know, the client's happy with it. So uh, I'd much rather uh, somebody give me a, a loud mix that they love uh, rather than undoing all of it and me trying to magically match all the settings they had on their two bus. Yeah, right. You know, because 15 years ago, if they had a limiter on, it was probably Waves L2, and those are not anything special, right? You can... 
you can recreate that in about three seconds if you know what you're doing. But now we're getting into more complex processing change where it's doing a little limiting, some multiband, saturation, widening. And even if it's subtle, when they take all those things off, now the mix is very different. And why make the mastering engineer try to recreate that when you can just leave it on there? I've changed philosophies too a little bit. Sometimes I'll just do a, a dummy check and say, you know, one, did your mix engineer know that it was being mastered elsewhere? Because this is just insanely smashed. And a lot of times it's, oh, yeah, the mix engineer didn't know I was having it mastered. So he'll happily or he or she will happily, you know, remove that. It was just a communication error, um, things like that. Um, but to me, it kind of depends on the level of the artist. And I don't want, like to be too judgy, but, you know, if, if a world-class mix engineer that I know the name of mixed it, they obviously know how the deal works. You know, it's going to be mastered and they've done great work. But if it's kind of like people just starting out the first time or two, like if it's a new band and they went to the local studio, they I'm guessing they didn't even talk about mastering until like the mixes were done and now they got to release it. And now they, and I've received MP3s to master that are maxed out. I mean, it's just, it becomes an education process when you're working with newer bands and artists. So I was just curious, but I'm kind of with you. If it already sounds good, you know, if the mix re is built around it, undoing it is very dangerous. Um, yeah, probably. the biggest thing you can do is hand back a client something that sounds worse than what he gave you. Yeah. Uh, so I just try not to ruin stuff. <laughs> right. I've had, and then I've had the opposite happen where the mix engineer did undo his limiting, mm -hmm. which was normally polite but what i i never heard the reference mp3s which were just insanely loud and we even had this conversation of like maybe we don't need to master it like 2001 cd levels let's go for something a little more reasonable and they were into that until they heard the master and I, I don't even feel like it was my fault because the only way to get that balance back of the drums and the guitars would have been to smash it like insane so i kind of just had to redo what the mix person did but the problem was I had no idea those existed. It was like after version three, I was like, what's going on here? And they said, well, here's the MP3s that our mixer was sending us. And I looked at them like, okay, yep. now I know what I have to do. And it was easy from there. So communication just becomes so key here. Um, we are going to, we are close to the end of the hour. There's one more question here um, and I need to read it. Um, it's in tiny font. Um, but if anyone else watching or listening has any questions, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, for Glenn. And as mentioned, you're also on Twitter. And um, I failed to do my research. Um, but I see that you're active on Twitter. Is it also GS Mastering? Everything um, GS Mastering. That Website, makes sense. Facebook. Yeah. So follow okay. Glenn. Yeah. Follow Glenn on Instagram and Twitter for sure. He's always posting great, you know, new projects, you know. I, uh, and the thing with mastering, like I mentioned, it's so fast paced. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm easily doing an album in a day and a few singles. With, with the transition shifting towards singles and that reminds me of another question um you know i find myself leaving a couple hours in the morning for just singles and then i'll do the album do an album or vice versa i mean it's we can f and without rushing we can fit in quite a lot of projects so that means every friday you know your instagram's blowing up with new releases and sometimes it's stuff you forgot that you even did or didn't know it was coming out um so i'm going to check out this question okay Um, well, this also ties into one of Brian's questions, and I know we talked privately about this, but um, whether you're traveling or um, at your home base there, um, you, which DAC do you like to use, and is, does it have a headphone amp built into it? Or, um, and how, I guess what does your monitoring chain look like, aside from the actual headphones? Is it a um, two-channel interface? And if you could just tell us more about your interface that you like to use. Sure. Um you can probably see, I don't know, can you see this from uh, where I'm pointing right now? I can see the, the top of it. It's got a circle in the middle. That is it. So um, that's my main, it's a DAC and it does have a uh, headphone amp built in. It's from a company called Cord Electronics and it's their flagship DAC called a Dave. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I'd recommend that for everybody because it's ungodly expensive, uh, but uh, it's, you know, the best you can get. And, you know, considering I used to use, you know, $100,000 speakers in a, you know, uh, architect design room, uh, I feel like it's a bargain now to spend a few bucks on something good for, uh, but uh, you can get something good that's not, you know, it's 98% as good as that for much less. 
So. Right. I feel like, you know, I always would tell my students to like, basically, obviously you're not going to be able to afford the studios you see online in magazines in the old days on day one. But if you are smart about money and just upgrade your weakest link, you know, today your weakest link might be your speakers or headphones. And then you might reach a point where you feel like your weakest link is the DAC um, or some software. You know, if you're just, if you can sustain a career and, you know, just keep upgrading your weakest link, you'll, you'll, you'll get there. I think your intuition will tell you what's, what's holding you back at some point, because maybe you'll get a project that is not going as smooth as usual. And then you wonder why, what, what am am I not hearing or what am I not able to do? And is there a tool that I could get or upgrade to, to get to that point? So I think uh, a big thing for like the guys that are looking to get into a headphone setup, uh, really try to match your DAC and your amp and your your headphones because uh, they run at way different impedances and efficiency, and uh, they really sound quite different depending on how you pair things. So uh, it's a matter of really um, looking and trying and seeing what fine tunes uh, to your ear. So okay, well, great. Um, one more question just popped in. Um, were there any workflow changes when you switched to headphones? Um, yeah, was there anything, um, you know, workflow wise, aside from not having speakers, you said at the same time, you also went all plug in, you know, you kind of did it all at once. It seems like you got rid of any analog tools and you got rid of all your speakers all at once. So, um, was there any, you know, particular workflow changes? Um, I think, um, first of all, you have to give your brain time to adjust, so that's, you know, the, I think what nobody really talks about is, you know, people put on some headphones and then they go, I didn't do a mix as good as I did before. Or my master doesn't sound as good as before, but it takes, you know, weeks or sometimes even months for your brain to adjust to the workflow and the relationship of the sound coming in your ears. So uh, once your brain finally adjusts, then you can kind of fine tune everything. And, you know, as far as working with uh, in the box, um, that's an ever evolving process. Uh, I've gone through a hundred inter- iterations of, you know, setups over the years. So uh, it keeps getting better every day. So, Okay. And then I have one final question, unless we get a good one here, but I kind of alluded to this earlier, but I'm seeing a big trend where people are sending me a single and another single and then, then they might send me like seven songs and they're going to say, we're going to make a nine or 10 song album and we need to use the previously master, you know, the previous songs to make an album. Um, do you find that happening? Part one is, do you find that happening a lot? Um, All the time. Yeah, me too. And I'm still, you know, the, the solution to that is not one answer, but um, do you find yourself, I have a hard time just taking the previously mastered songs slapping him in the montage and closing my eyes and, pre- and uh, not touching them. Now, I don't need to remaster them from scratch, but I feel like in the EP or album context, maybe what worked for this single is not really the best for the album. Maybe it needs to be a little lower level. Maybe it needs to be a little louder. Maybe the mix had more low end that you kind of left because you didn't want to change them, change it too much. But now all the other mixes came in and they're a whole lot thinner or brighter or different. You know, do you find yourself tweaking a little bit or do you just leave them as is because the artist approved them? It's going to depend on how long ago uh, the old songs were. If it's something that I mastered in 1998, yeah, for sure I want to tweak it. If it's something I mastered two years ago, it's probably pretty consistent with what I'm doing today. So, um, you know, most of the requests I get for like compiling a project from an artist that has, you know, I did some songs with you in 2017 and again in 2019, and I'm doing three more songs now and we're going to put it together. Um, they're probably going to be pretty consistent. So, Okay, uh, that's good to know. And then one final thing before we wrap it up, because someone else asked it, and I'm, I'm a huge proponent of file backups. You know, I love the saying, if you don't have it backed up, you don't really have it. Um, are there any tips or tricks that you care to share with, with the people watching about how you can back up files and, and not find yourself in a bad situation where you have to tell the client you lost it or it's not available? Well, let, let's uh, 
pre preface it with this. Uh, so my old systems, which like I said, were all exabyte and uh, eight millimeter tapes and things like that, nothing will load up anymore. So um, for the most part, you can't really save sessions and things like that that are gonna pop up 10 or 15 years later, but you can certainly save the highest quality masters. And those I back up to multiple locations. Uh, I have cloud backups as well as hard drives and in multiple locations. So, uh, you know, it's pretty safe that I can recall anything from anywhere. And, you know, if I'm in some place like, you know, Iceland or South Korea and a client says I need a song from 2017, I can just go to the cloud and grab a track and, you know, send it to. Them. So, yeah, I'm basically the same way. I mean, I have a couple of local copies. And then the, for me, the cloud is uh, worst case scenario. And that might change. And obviously, if you're traveling, you need to rely on it more. But for me, you know, I have everything in Backblaze going at least back 10 years. And if there was a such a disaster that I had to rely on that, you know, everything that I've spot checked, it's all there and it's, it's good to go. Um, I did want to see, do you have maybe an album montage that you can pull up on your screen just so we can just get a quick look of sure. what just because everyone wave lab is so powerful. You can, there's a million ways to do the same thing. Um, just curious if you have one just so we can get a, you know, you don't have to show us all your plugins and your secrets, yeah. but, uh, let's see. I think people just like seeing how other people have stuff laid out. Sure. Okay. So here's a album sequence. You can see it okay. back there. Yeah. And, uh, just, you know, uh, we've got your, uh, you know, different tracks here and you've got, uh, your CD tracks and your text and your metadata. Um, and, um, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's great. So, I mean, the, and everyone works a little differently. you and just as a reminder, you know, your tracks were already, you know, processed, yeah, this is all mastered tracks in the montage, right? So now. you're not even doing any uh, any processing whatsoever. It's all so that's that's why the waveforms obviously look so big. And then some people mm -hmm. might be running it live. There's so many ways to work. I was just kind of curious, but yeah, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the markers and CD text because that's like, you know, that's the stuff that the mixing DAWs just don't do. And right. there's you know they just that's not their wheelhouse. And that's where something like Wave Lab comes in, where it just specializes in that. Well. Um, the questions seem to have tapered off and we've been here for an hour. So we really appreciate your time in doing this and happy to see that you're using wave lab and uh, you know, maybe we can have you back sometime to do a little deeper dive into some, some things with the screen share and everything, but it was just great to hear your philosophy, workflow, your story, all that good stuff. So um, if there's any follow-up questions, you know, people can post them in the wave lab users group on Facebook and we can try to get answers to them. But um other than that, I'm going to say have a great uh, rest of your morning and afternoon and have a great trip to Iceland. I wish I wish I could go. I was supposed to go last year and it got canceled, of course. But yeah, we'll have a great day and thanks again. Nice chatting with you, John.